Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Inside Indy Sports Podcast. I'm Tyler James, and I'm joined once again by the one and only Eric Hansen. Together, we cover Notre Dame football, recruiting, and more for InsideIndySports.com on the Rivals Network. Three practices are in the books as Notre Dame football started preseason camp on Wednesday, as we're still in July. The Irish entered camp without director of football performance Matt Bayless, who resigned earlier in the week, but they've pushed forward with the preparations as usual. To get us back in the swing of things on the Inside Indy Sports Podcast, because we have done our share of vacationing, we asked one of our favorite recurring guests to return to share stories and give us insight, and that's former Notre Dame offensive lineman Bob Morton. Bob, thanks again for joining us. Tyler, Eric, always a pleasure to be with you guys. Love being with you this early in the season. Yeah, since we're here at the start of camp, when I mention preseason camp, what 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 is the memory that comes to mind for you? You know, I, so I had a really specific memory. I think it was my sophomore year. Um, you know, they they do all these hard knocks things in the NFL, but they kind of floated this college version way back in the day. And so I remember showing up that sophomore year to a bunch of cameras as we were trying to get moved into a dorm and stuff like that. It's just miserably hot. You know what I mean? And everybody else has no problem getting their stuff in. But when you got a bunch of linemen trying to move into rooms, just sweating through their shirts, it didn't make for very good TV. I think they... I think they cut the show after the first uh, half of the season anyway, <laughs> but uh, that that's it, man. I mean, you're just, you're, you're getting back, you know, after being uh, home for at least a little bit, you're kind of getting ready for the school year, but here a month before anybody else is on campus, it's just you and the guys. I've noticed that the players have been getting golf cart rides. They, they have these very sizable golf carts. Um, with m- multiple rows, so so guys could get carted to and from their dorms. I think. Did you guys have any golf cart access back then? We didn't. Now everything we did was in one location, right? So uh, we were uh, we were staying in O'Neill Hall, which is kind of the southwest side of campus. All the practice fields we practiced on were right there by the bookstore, southwest side of campus. South Dining Hall was right there, so uh, there was really no need uh, for us to have any kind of golf cart rides. But I'll tell you what, listen, I had to walk outside. Uh, just to mow my lawn a little bit uh, a couple days ago, and I sweat so much getting the mower that <laughs> listen, those these guys can have whatever carts they want in this kind of heat right now. <laughs> well, golf carts aside, <laughs> what do you feel like are the things? And maybe it's changed since you played, but what are the things you feel like are the most valuable takeaways from camp? I mean, is it? The conditioning aspect is the mentality. Is it the chemistry? What do you take from it? Yeah. So, so actually, I would probably take the three things that you had just said and and reverse them, right? So, the I think the chemistry is the the number one focus, right? You've been doing a lot of individual work, even if you've been lifting with teammates over the course of the summer. You know, you've been making individual progress on your body. You know, getting into the best physical shape you can be in. Um, but you've got to get back in your stance. You got to figure out how you're working with the you know a person who's been working on themselves for the last several months. And so you know, early on as an offense, our goal was to really sprint through the first couple of practices where it felt kind of sluggish uh, to really build that chemistry because you're only a few weeks away from competing against somebody wearing a different color. Um, the mentality and aggressiveness, again. Everything you've done physically is to get yourself healthy and in great shape. And and the joke is always you're never in better shape than the day you show up to fall camp, but you're never in better football shape than you are like three months into the season. But those two things are very different. And so learning how to give a hit, take a hit, getting your timing back um, and uh, and making sure that you feel confident laying your body on the line is is uh is obviously really important and then man, it's it's getting ready for the season you've got four weeks left of hitting somebody wearing your same your your same helmet and uh trying to really gear up to uh to to hit the beginning of the season just full speed um you know it, it, it's exciting you know what i mean like it two practices in a day with this kind of heat can suck sometimes but it's also like there's nothing we'd rather be doing than getting ready to to put a, put on a show on a Saturday. Bob, I'm curious your perspective on the the timing of of Notre Dame losing Matt Bayless with him resigning right before camp started. Given that he leads off season workouts, is there 
is there a silver lining to it? Like, hey, he got us through the offseason. We don't it's not as important now, or is it tougher to lose him right before this to, to camp because you need someone like that that's been with you through the summer to to get you through camp? Yeah, you know, I think if, if you're looking for a silver lining, though you really have to squint to see it, <laughs> it's it's the fact that what he's most valuable for is getting everybody healthy and ready, having the great summer, and then getting ready for this point right now. So if there's going to be a time to have just a radical and an abrupt departure, I mean, now is actually a better time than when the season ends and his job really launches in to full effect. Um, but yeah, it, strength coaches are, are interesting, right? I, I had two different ones and one I think mattered more to me on a day-to-day basis. Now is Mickey Marotti, my first three years, um, not just in the off season, but the attitude that he really helped me develop as a player Um, He was somebody that I counted on day in and day out. You know, no other coach would I really want to see at six o'clock in the morning than Mm -hmm. old Mick. Um, And then I had Ruben Mendoza and Ruben was a different, different guy. I I was closer to his assistants my last two years. Um, And, and his work was pretty much done when it came um, time for the season. And so it wouldn't have been difficult to make a shift from Ruben to someone else at this point in time. But if we lost Mickey right before the football season, that would have been pretty catastrophic for us uh, as a team. And so I know that anytime there's an abrupt departure, these players have a lot that they're processing. Um, I wish that there would have been a little more runway in terms of this type of decision. But uh, ultimately, they're they're in a good spot. Bayless gave him the, the best time that he possibly could have this summer and got the team ready to go. So... You mentioned Marathi and, and Mendoza. The approach is really different. Believe me, from the outside looking in, we could see that as well. And I think Mickey's still going, isn't he, at Ohio State? Yeah, he's still at Ohio State. Yep. Yeah. One of the best in the country. Yeah, he is one of the best in the country. So if you're Marcus, I mean, he did elevate Fred Hale, who has run Eastern Michigan's program before. But, I mean, if you're Notre Dame, do you feel like, Notre Dame needs to go after one of the best, most experienced guys to put in that role? Or do you think it's good enough to elevate somebody that's been in the program a couple of years? Once you know, they get through the season, that's when the timing would be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. I think that it's an interesting question. And, and I don't know enough about the, not just the scheme, but the structure that, that coach Bayless had within his team. Um, obviously getting somebody in that role, to handle like the the day-to-day stuff of in-season work, yeah. um, whether it's a continuation of what kind of, you know, Coach Bayless had done, whether it's implementing a little bit more of what Coach Hale has done previously. I think going ahead and promoting from inside for this interim time is really, really important. Um, but I do, I think Notre Dame should at least make a run at some of the best in the country uh, because of what we've seen Coach Bayless do um, in terms of getting people ready for the next level, um, changes he's made in their um, strength and conditioning program have led to you know on-field results. Uh, and so uh, to me, I think it's really important to to make a run for somebody who can can long term bring that kind of excellence. the The one thing that came up immediately on our message board and just about every message board that's related to Notre Dame and around the water coolers and so forth, the first thought people had before Marcus said anything was hazing. And I think it's a fair thing to ask. I also think it's an unfair conclusion to make until you get all the information, but I'm wondering, did that flash through your head at all in light of the Northwestern situation? And, and where are we going with this hazing thing too? Because I think, We're going to hear a lot of me too's at other programs, some that are absolutely legitimate and some that maybe are uh, enhanced or, or, uh, you know, puffed up bigger than they are. Yeah. So it didn't, it didn't run through my mind. I'm I'm doing calculations in my head as you're talking about it, but um, really what, what I thought um, was before um, coach Freeman spoke and after was, man, this is, terrible timing for such an abrupt departure and i hope everything's okay with him right um and so you know when when it comes across that it's personal 
you know, I would love to see behind the curtain and have a better idea in time. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. I hope it's not something that there's, you know, kind of some snow rolling downhill that will um, will affect the program long term um, because you, you can't run from that. Right. So right. just, de- you know, departing right before the season doesn't necessarily make that go away. To your bigger question in terms of kind of what's going on with hazing, you know, it's it's something that we we've, we've got to find a way to root out the 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 danger and catastrophic consequences of old school like generations ago hazing, while still creating an environment where you know freshmen and new heads inside can can do something to uh, kind of be humbled a little bit um, and. You know, for me, I'll never forget. I came, I came on board. We were at South Dining Hall, and they made Marcus Freeman our tight end, not the current coach, um, <laughs> sing uh, "I'm a Little Teapot" up on top of one of the <laughs> the tables. And there were a couple other guys that sang different things, and then they decided that they were going to turn their attention to me and make me do the truffle shuffle. Which, if you don't uh, remember the Goonies, there's somebody that was. Uh, very much like I looked when I came to Notre Dame, who just lifted his shirt and just let everything shake. And I was very uncomfortable with that. And I'll never forget Coach Willingham, who I'd never heard yell to that point. We're seven, eight days into camp. He comes in and he shuts the entire room down. And he says, like, Hazing's not going to be a part of this program. And it was an amazing thing because I felt protected. It was also like a disappointing thing because I was the guy who got that shut down. And it was literally like me and a couple of older linemen saying like, okay, what, what can I do to be humbled? And we agreed that after we got pictures taken, they were going to shave my head. And that was a very big deal. My mother was not happy about it, but Sean Milligan went and cut the red locks off. They grew back a couple of times and now they just stay away. (laughs) <laughs> but it was just, it was one of those things that I felt an amazing amount of camaraderie through that, but it was not an enforced hazing that put me in any type of danger or predicament like that. And so I'm very thankful that Coach Willingham shut that down from a very early moment in my career. Well, I'm thankful you did not have to sing I'm a Little Teapot. <laughs> I'm, I was not a little teapot at all. <laughs> I would have been a very large teapot. <laughs> um, Bob, something that Marcus spoke to um, on Wednesday was sort of the culture that Matt Bayless had played a big role in instilling in the program and how that's not just necessarily Matt Bayless's culture, but it's the program's culture. It's Marcus Freeman's culture. I'm curious. You talked about how Mickey impacted you when, when he left, was that something that you felt sort of still carried on within you guys and you guys still sort of live to the standard that that was set when you had him? Um. I will I, n- no, so not not in my experience. Now, what we had in our shift from what we were doing to Coach Weiss and team coming in is I felt like we were a bunch of people who knew how to scrap and knew how to fight, and we needed a system. And when Charlie came in, he inherited a bunch of people who could scrap and fight, and he gave us an offensive system, and we had a lot of offensive success with the same personnel that we had the year before. Um, I feel similarly in terms of strength and conditioning. Um, I like to say the the only reason I ever got on the field, uh, my redshirt freshman or my sophomore year for those four years there was was because of Mickey Marotti. I didn't I wasn't a whole lot stronger than I was in high school. Body composition clearly changed, but he had a way of um, instilling a toughness and a grit in in uh, his players through different types of activities that were just sheer power of will, like the kind of farmers carry, like how, how long can you carry these weights? And um, I knew I couldn't be the fastest. I knew I couldn't be the strongest, but I knew that I could be the person that held onto the weights the longest. And that was kind of really how I carved out an identity that got me on the field uh, my sophomore year. I don't feel as though um, our, our coaches, my fourth and fifth year really instilled a continuing and ongoing toughness. It was more focused on Olympic lifting and getting stronger and and using our bodies better, very controlled. And sometimes you just need that kind of crazy grit and toughness. And so that was something that I think we missed my last two years. Um, make no mistake, the 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 Bayless effect for this team in terms of their overall health and wellness and in terms of kind of NFL preparedness, which is a big thing that we can promote 
um, over the last you know several years that we couldn't promote previously um, is something that we will miss. And I think that you know some of the competition and some of the you know striving for excellence things that he put in can be carried forward. We just need to make sure somebody can carry the mantle of making sure that we can make promises to incoming freshmen and transfers that we're going to get them ready for whatever their dreams have for them too. Before I ask you the next question, I'm going to follow up kind of with my observation of what you just said. And, and I'll back you up on that because I feel like the that veteran group that Charlie inherited, he did a great job of getting you guys playing great offensive football. But then it fell off a cliff in 2007. And one of the reasons was things caught up to coach Mendoza's system. And also, I don't know that Charlie and, you know, he might bite, you know, push back on this, but I don't think he did a good job of building the program from the ground up. It felt like the younger players weren't getting reps. They weren't being developed. And when that roster turned over, they were, you know, the, the, pro way of doing things caught up to him you know it was a hard lesson for him to learn I think he adjusted in 2008 and 2009 but it was kind of too late yeah. um, to kind of save his regime so that's kind of my two cents on that what I will follow up with you on is you know in the extreme heat I don't know if you guys were still in two a day mode were you in two a days when you were okay so yeah, yeah. how did you deal with the heat how did your coaches deal with the heat as well? I mean, with dealing with you guys. Yeah. So I, when I think of uh, two day practices in this type of weather, yeah. um, I think of a really large trash bin and ice water. I just think of getting in the cold plunge before cold plunges were a thing, Eric. That's what I think <laughs> of uh, because you're a freshman and you see all these guys jump into these ice baths and you're like, these guys are crazy. And then about, a weekend you're like i'm gonna try this out and it's the worst 30 seconds of your life and then you just you can't wait to get to the end of practice to jump in um so our <laughs> training staff you know mike bean is still you know uh kind of working there um uh man i don't remember tony's last name jim russ was our uh, head trainer when we were there uh, we were doing all the things like we had the pills that you would swallow that would monitor internal temperature um and uh they were monitoring kind of liquid in liquid out the entire time i'll never forget like I, as a big guy i like to have you know a long kind of undershirt underneath my pads and i was standing in the huddle just soaked to the bone and i feel someone coming in literally taking scissors and cutting off um making my shirt a crop top which again <laughs> I'm, I'm a big little teapot there. Right. <laughs> and, and cutting that off because I, I just didn't understand like how much I was preventing my body from cooling down in the heat by having this soaking wet shirt on top of it. And so there's a learning process for people who haven't been through it and people who have been through it. You, you kind of slug away, you make sure that you're getting the right kind of liquids before, during, and after, and, and really just kind of monitoring, trying to avoid just the lockdown cramps that can take you out for a few practices at a time. Bob, we you spoke to sort of the camaraderie and the chemistry that's built in camp. I'm curious, from an offensive line perspective, when when do you think an, that unit needs to sort of know who the starting five is? Is that something that can linger into the preseason process, or is it better to get that settled earlier on? Yeah, I'm going to throw you a curveball of an answer here, Tyler, because uh, I went into our uh, 2005 season, and we had six starters. And uh, though – Though the history books will remember it differently, if you ask John Latino right now about that team, he would say through the season we had six starters. I I think you need to know who your key contributors are going to be um, going into like going into day eight or nine. Like you need to know who you can have battles going. Mm -hmm. you, you know, it's going to be this person or this person, but you've got to know what to expect when those people are in the game because you know, man, if you're top seven, you're going to see playing time. So if, if you're a backup guard that's going to see playing time, then the tackle and center needs to know what their job looks like when you're in the game. And so, yeah, you need to be really kind of locked in on, on that, you know, moving into next week, uh, late next week, because you're still doing the job of you're, you're trying to get your head and your neck and your shoulders and your body feeling good with all this contact. Then you start really nailing down how these plays are going to look with you in each position. 
you know, um, speaking of offensive line play, so we do like a little practice report online and Tyler usually does it. And it's a good thing because if I see an offensive lineman go against a defender, I can measure that. But if they're just pushing on each other, I would say, yeah, the guys were just leaning on each other, pushing on each other. It doesn't look like they're doing anything. And everybody's watching, you know, the other offensive linemen are watching. So what's really going on there? What is Coach Rudolph evaluating? What's he teaching that when they do go in the team periods against the defenders, that that's meaningful periods in practice? Yeah. So make no mistake, when it comes to evaluation, going offense versus defense is where it really comes to fruition, right? I'm not saying those other periods are throwaway periods, but in terms of evaluation, I've I've taken my fair share of practice reps off in those O-line versus (laughs) O-line moments, making sure I was ready to go against Derek Landry, you know, when the defense showed up. That that being said, like there, there really is something that you can see early on about how someone's lower body is, is operating like is somebody is someone's feet better are they aggressive with their steps is their form really solid when they're when they're doing a fit and finish drill like are they are they hit are they hitting their hips at the right moment are they extending at the right time like you can get a sense of whether somebody's feeling it not just that day but there's a chance that some of these old linemen are coming into fall camp and they look completely different than they did in spring camp my example for you is this Going into my fourth year, I had worn a neck roll for my previous two years. I always got stingers um, on the same side, and I would just lose feeling in my arm for, you know, 30, 60 minutes at a time. So I always had this neck roll. And um, finishing spring camp, I told Mick, uh, I told maybe it was Ruben at that time already, and the trainers, I really want to start fall camp without a neck roll. And so I did, and I worked all summer to make sure everything was strong enough and protected enough. And then all of a sudden we're doing one-on-one offense versus defensive line drills. And it's me and Trevor Laws, who is four inches shorter to the ground than I am any day of the week. And I'm able to get my pads under him and drive him off the ball in a one-on-one drill, which was never my strong suit. They were able to see early on my body position had changed over the course of three months. Um, just by seeing me in those types of drills. I wanted to follow up too. you know, there again, in the team periods is when I get impressed and so forth. But I mean, Harry Heastan was really good at being able to identify somebody, whether they were a five star or a three star, somebody that had NFL potential and pretty early in their career. So like Billy Shrouth is somebody he's really excited about, even though he's not coaching him. Um, Emil Wagner's another guy. What what possibly could he have seen in them that got him excited about? And and he's going to be right on both of them. I have a feeling. I mean, that's the trajectory they're on. Yeah, yeah. So I would say you're looking for angles, right? Because whether it's somebody six eight or you know six four, um, you know, like how how strong are they when they when they get into their you know run blocking fit position. Um, how comfortable are they sinking their hips when they're in a pass pro position? Um, obviously there's just the a- athletic, uh, ability that you need to have when you're in pass pro. Um, but you know, for me, if I can see somebody who is built for pass protection, but knows how to get after it and move their body and run blocking, even if that's just on a dummy or on another offensive lineman, I see the potential of that. And then it's, can I get that potential to play out when you're not blocking a brick wall, you're blocking another guy who's coming back at you. Right. And so, um, you know, whatever his metrics were, I wouldn't be able to speak to, but I think that's the biggest question for me is there are a lot of people who look really good when they're in practice, but when they go against their own defense, are they able to handle what the defender is trying to do and still stay on their trajectory? Bob, last one for me, we were seeing a handful of freshmen on the offensive line get broken in that weren't here for the spring, so everything's sort of brand new for them. Can you describe what it was like for you adjusting to playing offensive line at Notre Dame as a freshman? Uh, Yeah, so I'm going to give you two perspectives. One is mine, and one I want to give my perspective of Ryan Harris, who came in uh, the year after me. Mm -hmm. And the reason I give you those two is because I came in and decided very early on that I was going to be kind and let Jeff Fain keep his starting position. <laughs> and uh, 
<laughs> so, so I, I mean, I knew very early on, like this is a red shirt year for me to get bigger, faster, stronger, understand the game more. And all I wanted to do was when he had those practice reps was do everything Jeff wanted me to do. That was it. Do you need me to go hard? Do you need to pancake me? Like whatever you need to do, like you tell me and let's make this rep exactly what you need. Um, and my, my goal was literally whatever he does, I'm going to watch in film and then try and replicate it. And so I, I always wanted to finish sprints first. I always wanted to, you know, make sure I was uh, being supportive. I was, you know, effective on scout team and I was watching Jeff Fain. Then you kind of fast forward a year and you get, you know, somebody like Ryan Harris comes in and I'm expecting him to be watching the guy in front of him and trying to mimic everything that that, that guy's doing, right? And Ryan Harris comes in as jumping to the front of the lines and trying to run all the drills first. And, you know, some of us are kind of rolling our eyes, like, come on, like, dude, like just you, you you've got time. And then it was like the second game of the year that Ryan gets thrown into the starting lineup. And, and I mean, we couldn't have had that, you know, we couldn't have had any success, you know, those first two years, which we didn't have a lot, couldn't have any success without him. And then he was so instrumental, obviously, in the last two years, and that went on to have a great career. I think people know pretty early on what they're going into camp with the intention of doing. And you can do that really aggressively, really well, knowing that you're probably going to red shirt, but you can also do that and go earn a spot too. And so that's what's fun for me is trying to watch people and figure out what their intentions and goals are, because they're going to have, everybody has a different set of individual goals to help the team get to where they want to go this season and beyond. My last one is about a quarterback. So I'm going to ask you a Sam Hartman question, but I'm going to give you the Brady Quinn context first. So okay. you played with Brady when he was a developing quarterback and then a very good quarterback. It was almost like when Charlie came, you got a portal quarterback because he he made such a huge jump. But it felt like he was able to make up for – maybe deficiencies on other parts of the team and elevate your team to a BCS. Now you can tell me whether that's a good statement or not. I'm wondering if, if, if you feel like that was a true statement and do you feel like Sam Hartman can do the same thing for this team? Yeah. So I will say that I think that your statement is true. I think there's a lot of intricacies to that. I think that having John Sullivan and I in the interior of the line made up for a lot of like deficiencies well, of when there was like play. No, no, but, but, but I'm, I'm saying this is one part, right? Okay. So we, we might have seen something in a, in a blocking scheme in a front seven. And so John and I would have asked Brady to change the play. Brady would have changed the play. We would have ran it and it would have been out the front gate, Darius Walker for 30. Right. Um, but then, then at the same time, you know, was was it Brady throwing the ball or was it Brady having the confidence to put the ball up because Jeff Samarja, Mo Stovall, Raymond McKnight were going to go and make a make a play on that ball, right? Was it the play calling that gets John Carlson open on fourth and two? Like it was a really beautiful offensive, like just kind of coming together of that team. But what I will say is there were times that I failed at my job, Right. I will never live down Matthias Kiwanuka removing me from my cleats in one part of the line and moving me into Brady's lap. And Brady being 6'4 is able to like lean to his right and still throw a strike of a ball, get the ball out, get a completion, get a first down and allow me to just like try and forget that play until we saw it on film the next day. Like that's what you need in a quarterback essentially is someone who can take that one out of 10 other people mistakes and be good enough to, to make something out of that play. And you can do that with your legs. You can do that obviously with just your presence in the pocket. You can do that by delivering a dime. You can do that by throwing the ball away. Sometimes um, what excites me about Sam Hartman is he's, he's a leader. Um, when we didn't have a whole lot of time with the offense to see what we were going to have at the spring game, he went and had a great game kind of throwing dots to guys that I didn't expect to see that happening. And the chemistry he's going to be building with this receiving core is going to be exciting to watch. And if you've got somebody who's confident and comfortable under center, um, you, you like where you are starting a year. And so that that's what I'm excited about. I'm excited to not have questions about who the starter is and what he's capable of. And, and then we just hope that we, you know, he's healthy and clean jerseyed all the way through the season. 
All right, Bob, we really appreciate you taking time to talk to us and carving some time out for us and sharing some great stories with us. It's always a blast. And I always have a great time. Go Irish. All right, now it's time for questions. You can submit questions to us on Twitter or the Insider Lounge message board before every podcast. I'm at TJamesND and Eric's at EHansonND. First one I have is a long one from LDL Go Irish on the Insider Lounge. It was submitted for Football Never Sleeps, but I figured it would work on the podcast. So here we go. The loss of Matt Bayless as staff losses go, he is right up there with Mike Elston and Tommy Reese. Georgia has 13 2024 recruits currently ranked 5.9 or higher by rivals, and he has six. Therefore, identifying players like Joe Alt and developing them is crucial. I do not feel the talent gap on paper will close until ND makes the playoff virtually every year and has more players consistently drafted. In my opinion, they need three first-round draft picks and three second- or third-round draft picks in each recruiting class. For the junior and sophomore classes, who could be those six players in each class, identifying your choice for the first-rounders? For the freshman class, feel free to ID six players in any round one through three. As an example, Alton Fisher could be two of the three first-round talents in the junior class based on year recruited. Tyler, I'm going to let you go first and probably carry the ball with this one just because I had a commitment that didn't let me do all that research. Okay, no problem. I will start um, with the junior class, and I will note that, I mean, the Joe Alt and Blake Fisher are good picks. I had trouble getting to six um, with this with the group. Uh, the junior class has lost a number of players. Um, yes. So I had Joe Alt. Blake Fisher, a lot of players, a lot of yeah, yeah, um, and Audric Estime as first rounders. I don't, I don't think Audric Estime ends up being a first round pick. It's hard to be a first round running back, um, right. but those would be the three that I would consider first round potential talents in the junior class. And then as for second and third rounders, I had Mitchell Evans, Jaden Thomas, and then Gabriel Rubio. I, I, Evans is the only one that I feel good about in that range. I. I I think Jaden Thomas could get there. I think Jaden Thomas is going to have a successful career at Notre Dame. I don't know if he's going to be freaky enough to be someone worth a second or third round pick. Like, will he run a 40 time like uh, Chase Claypool or um, Miles Boykin? I'm not sure. And Gabriel Rubio was sort of a, a flyer. I just, uh, I, I, I didn't see a lot of other options that made sense to me. Good size and good bloodline. So, yeah. And I think there's some talk about him having a potential. Uh, I don't break maybe breakout season, uh, at least making a, a bigger impact this coming season for Notre Dame. Do you want to go when you when I do every class, you want to jump in every class? Or you want me to go through all the classes first? I jumped in a little bit. I'll jump in as you're going through them. I, okay, I would it. agree with you there. There's not a lot of great choices because a lot of, you know, Tyler Buckner, a lot of not saying he will be a, that high of a draft choice, but a right. lot of people in that class transferred. All right. For the sophomore class. The first rounders I thought were a little bit easier. Uh, Benjamin Morrison, Billy Shrouth, and Tobias Merriweather were the guys that I thought are probably at the top of that class. Um, and then for second and third rounders, I listed Holden Stays, Eli Raritan, and Jalen Sneed. I think there's a long list of guys that could be in that window. I think Tyson Tyson Ford, Jadarian Price, Nolan Ziegler, all guys that come to mind for me. So. I think the sophomore class has a lot of talent in that. And obviously we there's, we have a lot to learn about those guys. Morrison's the only one who's really proven himself um, of those guys I've mentioned, but um, I think, I think there's a pretty good crop of guys in that, in that class that could end up being NFL NFL players because of the level that Notre Dame recruited at. Cause those guys are all pretty, we're all pretty highly rated as recruits too. It's not like they're a bunch of nobodies, although Benjamin Morrison wasn't exactly a, a five-star recruit and, uh, someone like Holden stays was a four-star recruit, but not necessarily um, considered the best tight end in the country in his class. Yeah. Um, th the defensive linemen are interesting because like Josh Burnham was such a high, highly rated recruit as a right. linebacker who played quarterback as, as a senior in high school, also played linebacker. He, I, I know Al golden, the defense coordinator was talking about him today and he's pretty excited about mm -hmm where that could be but he's not there yet right the other guy that kind of jumps out at me is Aiden Gobira because sure. he was a guy that was a fast high-rising recruit as a senior very undersized for a defensive end at the time he's put on some weight now he's at 256 he came into Notre Dame maybe 230 around there 
uh, and people marveled his early workouts, how quick he was. Mm -hmm. And so if he can get that quickness with the size and not get lost in the numbers game, he may end up rising here, you know, later uh, as a guy that could be, you know, elite. So I, I would not lose hope with those two. I, I think you're right. There's a lot in that class that I like. Did you say Jaden Mickey? Uh, I didn't mention Mickey, no. And I think Mickey could maybe get in that class as sure. well. Uh, but we'll have to see how it plays out this year. All right. And then for the freshman class, I, I still went through the first rounder and second, third rounder. It's like I did with the other classes. The first rounders, and obviously this is extremely early. We've seen three practices of these guys. First rounders, I went with Brandon Vernon, Jeremiah Love, and Christian Gray. Um, and for second and third rounders, I went Jaden Greathouse, Drake Bowen, and Charles Jagasa. Yeah, I like uh, I like all those picks. I like Jagasa maybe as a first rounder. Sure. We don't know that right now. It's interesting because he's doing some practicing and he's he's rehabbing from that knee injury he's at 330 right now and he's six seven i didn't realize well he wasn't even listed as that tall as a recruit but i mean he's every bit of six seven um so and and, and thick it's it's really going to be interesting to see how he uh plays you know the wide receivers all those guys i mean flores was the guy early in the spring that impressed us Braylon James was the guy that had the most work to do. Mm -hmm. He may end up being really good as well. Sure. Um, you mentioned love. Everybody loves love. Um, Micah yeah, Bell, I Micah Bell. I mean, if he if he develops with that speed that he has, I mean, yeah. that's obviously going to be coveted. Right. So there's there are a lot there are a lot of things to like about that. That group, and then the freshman linebackers. You mentioned Drake Bowen. You know, Preston Zinner surprised me. Who's the other freshman linebacker? Jaden Osbury. Oh yeah, I don't know about a draft pick, but he's a guy that I'm prepared to be surprised about mm -hmm. um, during his career. I, I, in the blue goal game, I loved his instincts, and I love kind of his skill set, and and I, I think that rivals dropped his rating. He was ranked very high i think after his sophomore year and then kind of slowly sank in the rain ratings because they thought he was a tweener mm -hmm. uh, i'm not so sure he can't be a really good linebacker with good speed and and get the size that he needs uh, he's intriguing yeah i mean i think i think linebacker could be a hard position to project because the guys that like look like linebackers in in high school they might not end up being college linebackers by the end of their career like that yeah. i mean we've seen that with guys at notre dame like junior tui halamaka is already a defensive end uh joshua burnham and those guys were physically impressive guys um as linebackers but it's just hard to to keep up with the speed of the game and play that linebacker position when you already have that size and so i think um tweeners can sometimes end up being really great i mean look at drew tranquil for instance like no one thought drew tranquil would be a great college linebacker and he, he ended up having a really good career all right. Next question is from Nathan Reynolds at Enforcers twenty one seventeen. How did Fred Hale end up at ND a couple of years ago? Was he let go by Eastern Michigan, or was he recommended by Matt Bayless? And was it the plan for him to take over when Bayless decided to leave, retire, or resign? Okay, the part I I guess I'm not understanding the end of the question. Was it the plan for him to take over? I mean, that's what happened. So I I'm not sure. Well, what... I mean, I think I think I think the way I interpreted it was like, was he sort of the director of football performance in waiting? And I don't, I don't think that's the case. He was, he's oh, only been, I see. he's I only see. been promoted see. because of the circumstances. I don't okay. know that if Matt Bayless left yeah. in the off season, like in, in January, I don't know that Fred Hale would necessarily been promoted for the right. permanent role um, immediately. I think, I think, and I still think that Notre Dame will have a search for someone. It, it could, it could end up being Fred Hale, but um, I don't think yeah. that he was like, the guy marked to be the next Matt Bayless. Yeah. I would think that um, Fred would certainly, you know, I asked, I actually asked Marcus Freeman about it. Mm -hmm. and he said he'll get a chance to interview for it. You know, being in his mid thirties, I don't know that he has the experience that Notre Dame's looking for. Uh, now, when we talked to the tight ends uh, yesterday, 
you know, some of them were asked about Fred Hale and they all had some pretty good things to say about him. Uh, but again, it's not just about blowing a whistle. It's about setting a culture. It's about, um, you know, all these advances in sports science. And we're just learning about Fred Hale. He was kind of irrelevant to us because of Matt Bayless's just presence with the program. I mean, I, I feel like Matt has hired very good assistants because they've gotten taken away. They've, you know, other people have hired them to, to head their programs. Uh, Flint is down at Jake Flint is down at with Brian Kelly at mm -hmm. LSU. Um, Baloo was here. What? Maybe a year and yeah to Indiana and then is at Alabama now. So I'm sure that if Fred Hale isn't, um, the guy at the end of this cycle that he will have opportunities just having worked with Matt Bayless. Uh, that'll be something really good on his resume. Uh, Tyler, do you have more details about his hiring? Yeah. I mean, I, my understanding is that he chose to leave Eastern Michigan. I don't think he was fired or anything. Right. He was the co-director of sports performance in as recently as 2020 alongside Brian Fink. Um, and then in 2021, he came to Notre Dame and Fink became the lone director of sports performance for Eastern Michigan. So um, I think he saw this as an opportunity to take another step in his career and, and came here to Notre Dame to do that. And obviously he has um, gained some respect for, within the program to be able to be put in this position to uh, fill in for Matt Bayless in a pinch. All right, next question we have is from Hond on the Insider Lounge. Where do you see Jalen Sneed contributing to the Irish in 2023? And is he on track, ahead of schedule, or is there cause for concern for him? So, you know, I try to dig a little bit deeper into this, into my suppositions about how the scheme has evolved. And mm -hmm. in talking with Jack Kaiser, I got some of that insight. And it, it seems like, Jalen Sneed is going to have a role in this defense. They're going to play a lot more packages. And I think Al Golden really wanted to get the best players on the field, even if it was in a niche role. So, you know, Jalen Sneed is going to be rushing the pass or some. We saw him in yep. uh, defensive line drills before. He was at the defensive line cookout um, <laughs> at their house. So they didn't invite him just because he's a great guy. Um and I think you'll see him play some inside linebacker. He's at about 223 now. Play a little bit of Will. He'll play a little bit of Rover. I think his future, I thought he would end up being a Rover. Now I feel like, especially with Jaden Osbury there, that next year when the when we assume all those 50-year guys will clean out, and Jack Kaiser said this indeed will be his last year, that we'll see Jalen Sneed as the starting Will linebacker next year. So I think he's in a really good spot to help the team this year, and I think they're really happy about where he's going. Al Golden, in the time that I spent uh, listening to Al Golden today, said he was really happy with the way uh, Jalen Sneed practiced today. Now, I was surprised that he practiced, given the fact that when he was going through warm-ups, he had his helmet off a lot. He was kind of over to the side. So maybe these were in non, non competitive situations where he just looked very good in drills, but he's very excited about Jalen Sneed. Yeah. He, I, yeah, I don't think he was do, taking contact. I mean, we, I don't know exactly what he is dealing with. I would, my guess is a head injury. If he, he wasn't allowed to wear a helmet and hit people, um, Al Golden didn't want to, uh, elaborate on that, but he mentioned how he was dinged up. Um, so, I mean, that would be the only cause for concern is that he's dealing with an injury of some kind. But yeah, I think he's I think he's gonna play. I think he's gonna play some rover in base defense. He's gonna be a pass rusher at times. He'll play some will. I just think he's a very versatile player. He's probably the fourth linebacker in the rotation. Maybe the first in line after those three veteran players. Um, I think Nolan Ziegler will have a chance to get in the mix as well. But um I think Jalen Sneed's on track to to have a pretty pretty significant contribution for Notre Dame this season. Next question is from Marie Biafore at Biafore underscore Marie. 
I realize you've only had two days of practice, but so far, what are the biggest surprises for you? You know, I had a hard time coming up with a surprise because like Jeremiah Love, you know, I think both of us were had high hopes that he would impress early and he has. Um, and, and, you know, like Brennan Vernon and Traore, you know, I think they've flashed. But again, those are kind of guys I thought kind of probably or should should flash. I, I probably can give you a better answer, Marie when we see some scrimmage periods where they're in full contact, maybe Jaden Mickey as a surprise, although I felt like he would bounce back, but he had a really good day. The the first day that we were in practice on Wednesday, Mm -hmm. where you could see him being a starter on a lot of teams in college football based on what he was doing that day. So once they get the pads on and they're in full contact, I'll have a better answer. I will say one that I saw today, Spencer Schrader, the um, kicker from South Florida, has a big time strong leg. He um, he was nailing field goals from a lot of distances, and the w- one of the two he mi- he missed one from thirty, um, but not because it was short, and he missed one from fifty two, and it would have been good from sixty, but he sailed it wide to the left. But I didn't. I thought they probably have somebody that was comparable to Blake Groupie in in leg strength. This guy, who um, now we'll see how accurate he is, but he's definitely got the leg strength. Yeah, I, the corner cornerbacks. I'm, it's not really surprising, but it's nice to see uh, sort of the way they played that first day. Uh, I, I've talked about Steve Angeli and the ability for him to make some plays. I thought that that surprised me a little bit. I've I've been on them. Maybe Kenny Minchie overcomes Steve Angeli this this season, and maybe it still happens. But um, I thought Steve Angeli played better than I anticipated. Um, I, there's one that, I mean, I don't want to overreact. We've seen three practices now, and, and three and two of those have been the first five periods, so we're not even seeing competitive drills for the most part. Um, but Antonio Carter hasn't like jumped out at me. I haven't noticed him do anything of significance or of note. I think he's working in the background right now, and it might just be him sort of getting acclimated to things, and then once he gets things figured out, he'll make a leap up. But um, that was someone who I – I mean, I think could still end up being a starting safety for Notre Dame, but just hasn't really I, – I thought I would be more impressed with him early on, and obviously we just haven't had a ton of opportunities to do that, but there hasn't been something yet. So maybe that will still happen, but that's just something – I mean, if we want to get very in the details of something that I – was a bit surprised by that was that was something I thought I would mention. Yeah, I would agree. He has not jumped up yet. And Al Golden's comments today, he seemed to feel like that was to be expected. And he, I think his expectation is when we get to about halfway through camp. Mm-hmm. So we, we've got an open practice coming up, I think August 8th, where they're going to do it at a local high school. And I think that, that Antonio will be one of the people I'll be watching in that practice closely. Speaking of people we want to watch, next question is from NDF underscore discord. Which five players on each side of the ball are you most curious to follow throughout fall camp, regardless of where they may be on the depth chart? So quickly, I came up with Sam Hartman because Notre Dame hasn't had a quarterback like him in a long time. Yeah. And I really want to see the difference he can make. And then having sat down with him one-on-one with for a story that we're going to have next week, um, I just was super impressed with what what's going on above the eyebrows with that guy. I mean, it's it's really going to be fascinating to see what kind of impact, how he can impact this program. I put Jaden Greathouse on offense. We'll we'll do your offenses before we switch to defense. Um, just because, again, sometimes it's the rivals' ranking or the rivals' doubts in a guy. They felt like, did this guy peak as a high school senior? He was extremely productive in a great program, and yet to me, he's carried that over into Notre Dame, and he's getting better. He slimmed down. This fall, he went from 213 to 204. Um, 
Yeah, I think so. there were some there were some concerns. People thought, well, maybe he ends up being a tight end, but I, it yeah. doesn't doesn't look like that to me. <laughs> yeah, at two hundred four, um, Jeremiah Love just because he just oozes the it factor. So I kind of want to watch him. Kind of the same thing with Billy Shrouf. I I want to see if he turns into, you know, the next Quentin Nelson. Um, the, and that's very high praise, but I do think he has a similar kind of trajectory and he's similar in a lot of ways to Quentin. You know, there's not a lot of guys that make me want to watch offensive guard highlights. Quentin <laughs> Nelson was one of them. Uh, and then the last person on offense I'll say is Eli Reardon, just because again, I think if he can get his health stuff squared away, we could see a, an ascent here pretty quickly and convincingly of him being the next tight end one. He's, He's got a lot of guys competing with him, though. We have some similar positions, but not a lot of overlap here. I had Billy Strouth on my list. Um, I also want to watch Andrew Kristoffic. I think that right guard spot's important, too, so I want to keep keep an eye on that. Um, Holden stays at the tight end position as someone that I think he's very physically impressive. What can he do as a, as a helpful, maybe a number two tight end? Uh, can he overtake Mitchell Evans? I think that might be a little bit much to ask, but I, I think he certainly has a potential to be a very good one in the, in the uh, long term. But I think the that could be coming sooner rather than later, just based on the way he looks. Um, Jadarian Price, um, how how does he continue to look coming back from injury? Someone we were really excited about in his true freshman early enrolled spring. Um, and he's been given the responsibilities of, of playing and cleared to cleared to go. So I want to see how he, how he sort of handles everything this spring. And if he's going to be in position to contribute this fall. Um, and the last one is Tobias Merriweather. I think we all mm-hmm. sort of expect big things for Tob- from Tobias. Um, but I, I think just wanted to see him make some plays and, and practices um, on a more regular basis is something that I'm, I'm looking forward to tracking. Okay. On defense, I went with, um, Jack Kaiser, I, I you know, with him playing more of an inside role, I and, and especially at, at how well he knows the defense, I, I just think he he's one of the people that I identified as a breakthrough player, and I want to see mm-hmm. if I'm right. <laughs> um, another breakthrough player that I I thought is Jordan Botello, and again, Jordan has fascinated me from the second that he. Yeah, stepped on campus and then got sent home <laughs> uh, for violating COVID rules, and and you just thought, okay, this is either going to be a disaster or it's going to be an incredible story, and it's kind of right on the cusp of being an incredible story. Mm-hmm. So I, those are always exciting players to kind of follow. Cam Hart, just because you know, here's a guy that came in as a three star wide receiver where everybody's like, really. And then they flip him over to defense. And I think had he not had so many shoulder surgeries, we would have seen a a better version of Cam Hart than we have at this time. He's played through a lot of injuries. I think he has a chance to be an All-American. He said that to me in the spring and that he was going to be a first round draft choice. And I didn't, you know, I didn't laugh, but inside I went, okay, you know, that's good that you're confident and, Mm. I think he's got a chance. Um, Brendan Vernon, just because he's a really weird personality, and I mean that kind of in a good way, um, and a really interesting physical presence. You know, he was a five-star guy early in the ranking cycles and then uh, kind of dropped towards the end. But I I think that five-star potential is still there. I, I'm mm-hmm. curious if and when that emerges. And the last one, I'm the president of this fan club, is Jalen Sneed. I think he's going to be a star at Notre Dame at some point. All right, we got two similar ones because I have both Kaiser and Sneed. Um, I I went the opposite side of Jordan Botello, and I went with Javante Jean-Baptiste. Um, maybe that's because I'm writing a story on Maybe him. it's because I'm writing a story on him, but um, I'm very intrigued by him. And also, like uh, – Mitchell Evans, we talked to him this week, and he was asked who are the t- toughest guys to block. 
And of course he picked guys that he gets assigned to block, but he said Jordan Botello and Javante Jean Baptiste. And he was just like John Baptiste's length and speed is a really tough combination to deal with. And we haven't really got a chance to see a lot of it. I don't know. I mean, I hear more things about Javante Jean Baptiste than I've seen of him and partially because he didn't play in the, the blue gold game, but, uh, I'm very curious to try like a ski mask. Under <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, that we have pictures of him even like running to practice across the street. It's like, he doesn't want to be seen because he has like a, a mask covering most of his face and it's, and it's not exactly cold around here right now. So um, I, next time we get to talk to him, I want to ask him about that. Um, the other two guys are also transfers. Antonio Carter, who I mentioned, um, haven't yeah. seen a lot from him yet, but I, obviously someone I want to monitor this, this camp and also Thomas Harper, in part because we didn't get a chance to see him much in the spring because of the shoulder injury. Um, but I think Notre Dame is going to find a role for him um, and they're going to use him. And so I, I'm curious to see what that looks like and what kind of impact he can make on the team this season. All right. Next question is from Mr. Nev at Mr. Irish red thoughts on Al Golden's comments about preparation for this year's schedule. And for context, I asked him, I wanted to make sure I knew what he was talking about. And he pointed to the quote that Eric ran in a story the other day, um, that Al Golden said earlier this year, I hadn't seen all those college offenses before. I tried to catch up. It was hard because I got here so late. I know the personnel better. I know what the strengths are and what they can really do well. So, I, I you know, I, I think the question is, why did they hire him then? And then also, is this remedied now, right? Right. I think so. so yeah. um, I think that Marcus especially knowing that they wouldn't get Al Golden until possibly after the Super Bowl and they were willing to wait for him, that there was going to be a trade-off between him being prepared for spring and him even being as, you know, I think maybe Marcus maybe um, underestimated a little bit the reentry period going back to college after not being there for six years. And yet I think Al Golden was – a stabilizing force for Marcus and Marcus felt like that part of it, having somebody that he could lean on and ask questions was worth it. And then eventually this would play out. Now it's possible Al Golden would have only stayed a year and then Marcus would have, that wouldn't have been a good investment in year two. And, and again, just hearing the linebackers today talking about the schematic improvements. Um, I think they're really excited about how this defense has been streamlined and yet has evolved to being just more efficient. I, I do think their defense is going to be, has a chance to be the surprise story of this team kind of based on that. And I followed up with Al Golden a little bit today and kind of asked him the question a little bit differently. And he said, you know, what he tried to do was take a lot of things out. There were so many things that they learned that they didn't need. And now knowing what the opponents were like, he had that whole off season to really hone in on what really they needed to keep into the defense. Yeah. I think Jack Kaiser probably said it best. First of all, the linebackers need to be game changers. And I think this, the schematic changes will help them do that. Um, the other thing is they are going to be able to do things where they can keep, keep not have to swap out personnel necessarily. If somebody's up tempoing them, they have players that are versatile enough that they can be doing rushing the passer one down and in coverage on the next down. And right. so they're pretty excited about those. So I don't know that I answered your question, but hopefully, <laughs> um, hopefully I gave you some sort of information. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I even think of that quote that I cited there that Mr. Neb passed along. I don't know that that whole quote is about the preparation for last year. Like I think he was trying to catch up with the schedule, but then he, he needed to know the personnel better within his own team. And so like, right. I think there was, he was trying to learn a lot of different things at once and the the timeline was shortened for him. Um, and he hadn't been in college football. So I think that all those things sort of came together that, he needed. He wasn't sure exactly what all he needed in a defensive scheme because all the things that he needed on the NFL level weren't necessarily things that they needed at the college level. Um, and so I, I think that that 
that's that sort of speaks to the paring down of certain things that they're getting rid of this off season. Um, and now obviously he's very familiar with Notre Dame's roster. He doesn't need to spend as much time in the off season trying to get to know those guys. Cause he was there coaching them last season. Um, and they can spend more time preparing for the upcoming opponents and having the, the understanding of, of, of what those teams did and, and of seeing, seeing some of them last season as well. So I think, We'll, he's got a full off-season cycle this year, whereas he certainly didn't last year. And I wrote an analysis uh, just going into about that, the, the, yeah, I mean, this is going to be interesting how he deploys his defense. It's one of the big storylines of the early part of the season. And uh, but But one thing in his defense, Notre Dame had switched schemes so much when he came in that there were remnants of those schemes and they kind of had to clear the hard drive of these guys in habits and terminology. And he said it really took the whole spring to get that settled down. So uh, they didn't have to do that this year. They just were building on what they had already, already built. And I think we will see the fruits of that. What Al Golden hopes one of the things that they're able to do that they weren't able to do last year is force turnovers. Yep. Uh, next question is from Rocky R- Rockney 93 on the inside lounge. Any word on the contract negotiation for on contract negotiations for the upcoming apparel deal is Andy sticking with under armor. I thought it was supposed to be announced in July. Uh, that's the word that Jack Swarbrick said in the interviews that he chose to do. Um, at least that's what those people reported. So we still have a few days left in July. Uh, but I mean, the contract doesn't expire until next year. So if they need to, um, finish up their negotiations, they certainly have time to, I haven't really been following it as much other than I know it's allegedly down to Under Armour and Nike. And, uh, again, I think that under armor under delivered on their promises so i would take a good hard look at nike yeah i mean i i don't know when it's going to be announced i and whenever it's going to be announced it's probably going to be on I'm glad under- it wasn't when tyler and charleston were on vacation <laughs> i mean it's going to be i mean we're talking about a multi-million dollar deal here it's going to be announced on nd's terms and when it wants to be announced and I'm sure there's going to be some sort of rollout. Like maybe it won't be the same way if it's just a renewal with Under Armour, but if it's a a, a new outfitter like Nike, I'm sure there'd be all kinds of um, promotion for that. So um, it's going to be. They had a special press conference for Under Armour. Yeah. So, I mean, when, when they're ready to tell us, we'll tell you about it. Um, but they're not ready to, to do that quite yet. All right. Next question is, and last question is from at Charles W. Wolf. This is a shot in the dark, but any chance Notre Dame will ever have their vacated wins restored under new president Baker? I have been meaning to ask, but the Tennessee scandals reminded me. I I do think it's a shot in the dark. I don't think that's Charlie Baker's priority. I mean, they could certainly ask him. I don't know what motivation. And then if he did it for Notre Dame, you know, are they going to review everybody's vacated wins? I think the only way those wins come back on the on the docket or whatever come back on the archives is if the NCAA ceases to be that if the conference is really at some point take hold of the rulemaking and the policing of college athletics if and and there's been talk about that happening um that that maybe just when they make that move that those records will all go back to what they were but I just don't see it being a priority for either Charlie Baker or the NCAA. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I have my doubts that it'll it'll they'll be unvacated. Um, I and if I I'm, think it should be, but I don't think it will be. If if I'm not mistaken, I think Tennessee's going to have to vacate wins too. Um, but I, I the, it it still had to be determined which ineligible players played in the games that 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 would be that. If I understood it correctly, there was a lot of stuff in the in the uh, announcement of its uh, findings and, and uh, punishment, but a number of wins was not included, but I thought it said that they would, they would have to vacate wins once they determine how many games ineligible players played in. 
And and for people that don't remember or didn't follow it, so why those wins were vacated, it was the frozen five. It was the five players that allegedly um got special help with their schoolwork from uh somebody that had been a manager. She's actually dating one of the five players. And the I think the sad part, and I think this is where Notre Dame was misled. Notre Dame wanted to give those players their due process to go through and see if they deserve to be able to stay at Notre Dame or should they all be expelled. If Notre Dame had just expelled all of them at that point, they would not have had to vacate those victories um, from what Jack Swarbrick had told me. But they gave due process. Um, Some players left Notre Dame or were asked to leave Notre Dame Kavari Russell actually worked his way back and played another season. Ishak Williams was cleared for Notre Dame to come back for another season, but never cleared by the NCAA to do so. So it was very complicated. But I think Notre Dame did the right thing. I just think that was one of the stupidest applications of vacating victories that I can remember, but I mean, I've been dealing with NCAA for a long time. There's been a lot of stupid. I think v- vacated wins in general are pretty stupid. Like everyone knows they happened. Like it's not like people forgot. They're like they have to erase those games for the memory that that didn't happen. Like it's it's only the NCAA's record books that it impacts. Like even Notre Dame, they include those wins still. Like they do at when first they, count. they didn't. Yeah, and it, and it was very confusing because <laughs> they didn't. Give, and then they started giving both sets, and now they just say, ah, this is, you know, Brian Kelly's record is such and such. Yeah. So. All right. Well, that's it for today's episode of the Inside Indie Sports Podcast. Thanks for welcoming us back. If you don't already, you can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and other popular podcast platforms. If you like what you hear, give us a star rating, leave a review, and share our podcast feed with whoever works on your air conditioner. We're planning to have at least one podcast and one football never sleeps on YouTube just about every week to the end of the football season moving forward. So we won't necessarily have a set schedule during camp, but once we get into game weeks, we'll have more of a routine. Um, so you can count on hearing from us uh, frequently moving forward on both of those platforms. So thanks for being patient with us as we were more sp- sporadic throughout the summer with some vacation time, but we are rocking and rolling now and ready to give you all the content you want on our podcast, uh, our YouTube page, and on the Insider Lounge. We'll we'll be back next week. Um, but until then, stick with InsideNDSports.com for all your Notre Dame coverage needs. <laughs>